And those are clinical trials that are done. This is a retrospective database analysis. Yeah, so that's a good question. Go ahead. There is, there is. So uh, if you look at childhood depression, let me kind of just give you a broad base in terms of what is depression in terms of symptomatology, and then we'll talk about childhood depression. So if you're looking at major depressive disorder, you need to have five of the following symptoms. One, depressed mood, okay? lack of interest, which we call anhedonia. You need to have sleep disturbance, impaired concentration, okay? so you're not able to concentrate at work or at home. Uh, decrease or an increase in appetite. With that, you have weight loss or weight gain, depending upon where you're going with that. Psychomotor agitation or retardation. You're very slowed down or you're extremely irritated. And suicidality. So I gave you nine symptoms here. Of the nine, you need to have had five, at least for a period of two weeks, which then results in an impairment in social and occupational functioning. So that's what you need. In the absence of substance abuse, in the absence of a general medical condition. That is major depressive disorder. Okay. How is a child different? When you look at symptoms in a child with uh, depression, an adult would endorse more of a depressive kind of mood, while a child has an irritable mood. The child could also be very withdrawn or isolated. So there are certain stark differences, but other than that, the symptomatology is going to be vastly very similar. Okay? So there may be certain characteristic symptoms that may be different in a child. So, you know, academic grades are failing. So those kinds of things is something that the parent needs to be looking out for as warning signs. And so does the teacher. Yes. Absolutely. That's a, that's a very good question. And that's exactly where psychotherapy comes into play. So, I mean, there's only so much that you can do. You cannot, unless you're able to transplant the kid, you know, transplant the individual from their house to some, somewhere else, which is not possible in a vast majority of the cases. Then you look at interventions that can kind of be geared towards it. You have interpersonal psychotherapy. Do they have relationship issues, whether they're interacting with their siblings or with their parents? Uh, is this somebody who would benefit from insight-oriented psychotherapy? So there are different kinds of psychotherapies. So based on what they present with, what their family dynamics is, then you start customizing treatments, psychotherapeutic treatment interventions. And then, of course, you know, if they're above 18, is there a way in which they can get out of that dysfunctional kind of family setting? Now, in the West, what has happened is that over the last decade or so, we have, there has been a paradigm shift in how we define treatment success. Until about a decade ago, we were very happy if an individual, let's say a person comes in, is depressed, gets started on an antidepressant or is in psychotherapy. At the end of those six weeks to eight weeks, there is a 50% improvement from when they started off. That's termed a response. We are no longer satisfied with response. We have higher treatment goals. We are now looking at remission which is an improvement in symptom complex associated with an improvement in social and occupational functioning. Remission then gets you on to the stage of recovery, which is an improvement in the overall quality of life. How do we integrate an individual back into whether you know, they had an occupation or back into the society? So it's not just symptoms that you're treating, but you're also trying to kind of you know, get them socially integrated back into their respective communities. Because if you look at the West, there has been a drastic cutting down of the number of beds in hospitals. There used to be these old state hospital systems. And you can keep them forever and ever and ever. Not anymore. I mean, there are budgetary constraints. So you really need to get them back into work rehab, vocational rehabilitation. How do we get them back into the community? So, ma'am, basically we are assessing at the level of GFA. 
No, we do Hamdis. If you're looking at depression, we have different kinds of uh, scales that we do. Hamilton depression rating scale, the Montgomery Asperg depression rating scales. You have the Beck depression inventory. If you're looking at uh, schizophrenia, for example, you have the positive and negative syndrome scale. So there are, you know, these scales are very extensive in terms of uh, Hamdi, for example. It takes our raters anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes to administer. You don't have to use these research scales. We do research because that's, you know, that's pretty much our staple. But if you're looking at real-world real clinical settings, you can use a Likert scale on a scale of 1 to 5. What are the symptoms you present with? On a scale of 1 to 5, how much, you know, where is your depression? 5 being the worst, where is your depression? And then once you get them started on the treatment intervention, you monitor them. Because you need to have a way of monitoring these symptoms. Otherwise, it's futile. Right? I mean, you, does, does it work? Does it not work? You really need to have a way of kind of monitoring this uh, symptomatology. And uh, if uh, around because uh, this medicine, uh, medicine uh, if we are applying uh, another uh, more of treatment like psychotherapy and all that, yeah. at the time if we are implementing two therapeutic modalities, yeah. then is it difficult to uh, get an uh, understanding like which treatment plan is working more? Correct. Correct. So, so what you do, end up doing is, let's say you started the individual on a medication first. So you need to make sure you've provided them an adequate trial. Adequate trial is defined as an adequate dosage of the medication, so the maximum ceiling dose that's recommended, given for an adequate duration of time. So which is at least 10 weeks. Now it's like the standards have changed. Initially it was 6 weeks, now it's 10 weeks of an adequate trial being on a higher dose of the medication. If that fails, you have different options. You either augment with another medication or you want to add psychotherapy to it. So clearly you have made an assessment. It's not like adding one after the other. So this way you don't know which one is working, which one is not. So you want to make sure you do it systematically. So making sure it's a failed, uh, you know, the trial was a failed one before you go on to add. If there's a partial improvement, you're better off adding something or adding psychotherapy. If you have, if the person is a non-responder, you are better off changing it to another medication. As I said, there are 30 different antidepressants that are out there, right? So you clearly have a lot to choose from. All right, I see Dr. Parker is here. Did you want to take over from here? No, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about mental health scenario in Southeast Asia. Accounts for one-fifth of the world's psychiatric patient population. Yet, Southeast Asia, yes. So 20% is what you're looking at. Yet a small percentage of mental health providers, what is the number is 4,000, 4, is that right? We talked about it at the meeting. Only 4,000 psychiatrists in India. So it's this very small number. I was talking about the state of South Carolina being 10 per 100,000, and we are on the lower end. But here you're looking at 4,000 for this country. Because India. India. <laughs> So clearly, I mean, there's a lot that needs to be done. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about integrated uh, care models that we talked about earlier in the Global Health Care Summit. Yeah, I just gave you, because I didn't have the Indian stats, what the numbers are. So that's one of the reasons why. Correct. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. There are also war zones. Sure. And also, these are only reported cases. So we are, there is a lot... There's a lot that's underreported too, un undiagnosed cases. Very high rates of suicide, you pretty much are very aware of this. And of course, there's a great deal of taboo and stigma when it comes to addressing mental health. We talked a little bit about kind of the, you know, the children, young adults, but what about the elderly? I mean, if you look at the United States, you know, there's an, with the baby boomers, we are going to be faced with a very similar situation as is India. 40% of the elderly in India live be below poverty line. By 2015, just around the corner, 50% will be elderly women. Women have high rates of depression. The ratio is 2 to 3 is to 1, okay, compared to men. Also, uh, Alzheimer's, rates of dementia is on the rise. So clearly, this is something that we really need to keep a finger on the pulse. 2025, the number will be 177 million. Here are the stats. Average lifespan is 66. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is kind of from about a year ago. Uh, you know, infant mortality rates, death rates. But let me tell you something. If you have a mental illness, your life expectancy is 20 years shorter than the general population. 20 years shorter. That's mighty significant.